is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Obelisk Gate by N.K. Jemison, brought to you by Jason. In this episode, I am covering chapters one, two, and three. Nasun on the rocks, you continued, and Shafa forgotten. In these chapters, we get some POV from Cyanite's uh, lost daughter and some background on what happened there. And also, I don't know what to make of Shafa's POV at all. I am... It's very disturbing, also very confusing, and I I just am kind of lost, and I'm low-key, like, I want to know what is going on, but I don't want to go back into his POV again. I did not like it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. My apologies for starting this late. I think there's only one person here, so I think it's winding up to being fine. But uh, yeah, guys, I am having, as you all know, probably some pretty bad computer problems. And my computer just flat out like would not run GarageBand. So I am going to be tearing the sound from this Crowdcast file in order to post this episode rather than doing my usual thing. And the previous GarageBand file that I converted for my episode of Deadwood did not convert properly either. So I'm probably going to do the same thing there. Just not been a great day and I can't wait for my new computer to come. And many, many thanks to everybody who donated to that because I would probably be much more of a mess right now, uh, not knowing what I was going to do. So this episode um, was brought to you, like I said, by Jason. Thank you very much, Jason, for um, getting me started on the second book in this series because I've been really really interested in what happens. I've been thinking about this book a lot. Um, and I had to do that math that I often have to do with uh, Kindle books where I have to divide it by what the pages are in the paper book and then figure out how many Kindle pages equal a regular paper page. So the first three chapters are roughly 50 pages. Um, so we start off with chapter one the first sentence is, hmm, no, I'm telling this wrong. And I was like, that's an interesting tonal shift because personally, and I've said this on other book club episodes, I have always been a huge fan of the third person omniscient conversational sort of style that like a lot of for example, like British children's literature has where it feels like the person who is narrating the story to you is aware of you as the reader and like references that. And this is, it's not like the, the previous book didn't have any of that, but this feels a lot more direct than any of the other uh, moments did. Um, and the first paragraph is, after all, a person is herself and others. Relationships chisel the final shape of one's being. I am me and you. Demaya was herself and the family that rejected her and the people of the fulcrum who chiseled her to a fine point. Cyanite was Alabaster and Inon and the people of poor lo lost Alia and Maov. Now you are Tirimo and the ash-strewn roads walkers and your dead children and also the living one who remains, whom you will get back. That's not a spoiler. You are a soon, after all. You know this already, don't you? Do I? I have to be honest that I'm not entirely sure what this first paragraph even means. There's like, I understand the relationships chisel the final shape of one's being. But as far as actually being the person in that relationship, that's a whole other vibe. Um... And I'm not really like, and, and the, that's not a spoiler is such a, again, direct reference to the fact that I am aware that this is a story that you are experiencing. 
And I'm going to use somewhat modern verbiage to describe that. Um, so yeah, this was just a, a really like weird, I don't want to say confusing exactly, uh, just a surprising, I suppose is just the word, a surprising first paragraph because the whole tone of it felt so different and so, um, so much more directly engaged with the reader. So next, next, uh, sentences, Nasun next then. Nasun, who is just eight years old when the world ends. There's no knowing what went through little Nasun's mind when she came home from her apprenticeship one afternoon to find her younger brother dead on the den floor and her father standing over the corpse. We can imagine what she thought, felt, did. We can speculate, but we will not know. Perhaps that is for the best. Here is what I know for certain. That apprenticeship I mentioned? Nasun was in training to become a lorist. So this sentence is not really true, though, is it? It says Nasun was in training to become a lorist. But, oh, sorry, I'm just seeing that uh, Tony's made some comments here. Shafa's chapter is terrifying, yes. The whole you is such an interesting choice as a writer. I'm a big fan. And yay, Jason is here. Hi, Jason. Jason, I got started late because of some computer problems and uh, my apologies. So this isn't exactly true. She isn't in training. She goes to a, a lorist and gives the lorist a piece of diamond. We find out later um, that is far more valuable than what she should be offering for something for an opportunity like this and wants to become a lorist but she doesn't really like get officially started. And so saying she is quote in training to become a lorist feels like a complete misrepresentation to me. And I am not sure if that's on purpose or not. Um, so let me get a little bit of background here on what exactly stone lore is. Um, and it turns out that there were a people, a group of people 25,000 years ago, According to the lorists themselves, which most people think is a blatant lie. In truth, lorists are an even older part of life in the stillness. 25,000 years ago is simply when their role became distorted into near uselessness. They're still around, though they've forgotten how much they've forgotten. Somehow their order, if it can be called an order, survives despite the first through seventh universities disavowing their work as apocryphal and probably inaccurate, and despite governments down all the ages undermining their knowledge with propaganda, and despite the seasons, of course. Once lorists came only from a race called Regwo, West Coasters, who had sallow reddish skin and naturally black lips, and who worshipped the preservation of history the way people in less bitter times worshipped gods. They used to chisel stone lore into mountainsides in tablets as high as the sky, so that all would see and know the wisdom needed to survive. Alas, in the stillness, destroying mountains is as easy as an origin toddler's temper tantrum. Destroying a people takes only a bit more effort. So lorists are no longer Regwo, but most of them tint their lips black in the Regwo, Regwo's memory. Not that they remember why anymore. Now it's just how one knows a lorist, by the lips and by the stack of polymer tablets they carry, and by the shabby clothes they tend to wear, and by the fact that they usually do not have real calm names. <clears throat> so, the, um, the lorist who has come to Tirimo is named Ren Three Lorist Stone. She is mostly unimportant, but there is a reason you must know of her. She was once Ren 3 breeder Tentik. And we get a little background on like how she ran away with this guy and he was a lorist and then he like left her, but she still does, like was interested in what he had been doing. So she becomes a lorist out of um, necessity, pretty much. Um, when Nasun appears at the way station where she has set up shop. It's possible that Ren 3 thinks about her own apprenticeship. Um, not the seduction part. Obviously, Ren 3 likes older women. Emphasis on women. Oh, see, I said earlier that she ran off with this guy. But that's not true. It was a woman. Um, seduced by a then young woman away from a boring life as a glassmith. My bad. Um, the day previous, 
uh, run three pass through to Remo, uh, shopping at market stalls and smiling cheerfully through her black daubed lips so as to advertise her presence in the area. Um, Nasoon had skipped crash today to come and find her and bring an offering. So here I think, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first reference we get to what currency looks like in this world. Um, if we've gotten mention of it before, it didn't really sink in with me the way and it might, we may have gotten mention when we were traveling with cyanide and alabaster for paying for the rooms and stuff. But um, this is a lot more specific and strange than I expected. Um, Ren 3's offering cup has already been filled with brightly colored shards faceted with the Corton's mark. Um, she m- mentions earlier using jade chips to buy traveling supplies, spent the mother of pearl commission, um, mother of pearl to commission her own set of tablets, um, and bought many strong drinks at a tavern with the cabochons. So the stone and shells and whatnot being used as currency, I find really, really interesting. And the fact that like, she is given this diamond and we find out that the diamond is not actually used as currency often because it can't be quote sharded for change easily, which is also a really interesting, like how do you, this is the sort of shit that fascinates me guys. I get way too preoccupied with logistics and I am dying to know how exactly you sh- learn to shard the right amount off for change and how you can keep from being like completely cheated and how you can tell somebody like exactly how much of a shard you're going to charge them. Like, how does that, do you say like, Oh, that'll cost you about three millimeters of Jade. Like, how do you say what something costs? I am just really caught up in, in the whole idea of this. Um, Nisun stops on the threshold of the way station, panting to catch her breath, which makes for a very dramatic entrance. Um, Nisun doesn't have any money beyond her allowance, you see, and she'd already spent that on books and sweets when word came that a lorist was in town. But no one in Tarimo knows that there's a potentially excellent diamond mine in the region. No one, that is, except Origines. And then only if they're looking. Nasun's the only one who's bothered in several thousand years. She knows she should not have found this diamond. Her mother has taught her not to display her originy and not to use it outside of carefully prescribed practice sessions that they undertake in a nearby valley every few weeks. This is not something that I think we knew at all, did we? Like, I wasn't aware that Cyanite was training her daughter um, and that her daughter was, like, quite aware of what she could do yet or... I guess I I should have assumed that because, you know, baby origins can still do stuff and and grow up with this awareness. But I just had no idea that she didn't know that she was training her and like getting her to control her abilities yet. Um, No one carries diamonds for currency because they can't be sharded for change easily, but they're still useful in an industry mining and the like. Nasun knows it has some value, but she has no inkling that the pretty rock she's just given to Ren3 is worth a house or two. She's only eight. And Nasun is so excited when she sees Ren3's eyes widen at the sight of the glittering lump poking out of the black hunk of rock that she stops caring there are others present and blurts, I want to be a lorist too. Nasun has no idea what a lorist really does, of course. She just knows that she wants very, very much to leave Tirimo. Yeah, well, you would, wouldn't you? Like, she seems already at her age to be quite aware of the danger that she is in. And I feel for this poor girl. Like, what is it like to be a child surrounded by people that you know if they find out, if you slip, that they will kill you? Like, her own father kills her little brother later, guys. This is so, uh, so gross. Um. Ren3 would be a fool to refuse the offering, and she doesn't. But she doesn't give her an answer right away, because she thinks Nasuna is cute and that her declaration is no different from any other child's momentary passion. She's right, to a degree. Last month, Nasun wanted to be a engineer. 
Instead, she asks Nasoon to sit, and then she tells stories to her small audience for the rest of the afternoon until the sun makes long shadows down the valley slope and through the trees. When the other two visitors get up to head home, they eye Nasoon and drop hints until she reluctantly comes with them, because the people of Tarima will not have it said that they disrespected a lorist by letting some child talk her to death all night. Um, so, in the morning, Renthri goes back to Tarimo and figures out where Nasoon lives and turns over the stone to Nasoon's father. And it's just basically like, look, she brought this to me as an offering. It's worth way, way more. And she should not be handing this over to me. Um, and let's see. G, uh, Jija comes to the door when Ren 3 knocks, and for an instant, she's a little taken aback. Jija is a mid ladder mongrel, same as Esun, though his heritage leans more towards the Sanzed. He's big and brown and muscular and bald-shaven, intimidating. Yet the welcoming smile on his face is wholly genuine, which makes Ren 3 feel better about what she's decided to do. This is a good man. She cannot cheat him. Here, she says, giving him the diamond. Um... And he, once he, when she explains to him what happened, he's like really grateful to her and he puts the thing in his pocket. There follows this paragraph. There was not any one thing that turned Jija against his son, understand? Over the years, he simply had noticed things about his wife and his children that stirred suspicion in the depths of his mind. That stirring had grown to a tickle, then an outright irritant by the point at which this tale begins, but denial kept him from worrying at the thought any further. He loved his family, after all, and the truth was simply unthinkable, literally. He would have figured it out eventually, one way or another. I repeat... He would have figured it out eventually. No one is to blame but him. So, he figures when he sees what kind of stone this is, this is like another small piece of evidence that his kid is not normal and that this was found because of some ability that this kid has. And he's just sort of thinking this when he has the stone in his pocket Guys, I hate this so much. But then Uche wakes up. Jija walks him into the den, asking him if he's hungry. Uche says he isn't. Then he smiles at Jija, and with the unerring sensitivity of a powerful origin child, he orients on Jija's pocket and says, Why is shiny there, Daddy? The words in his lisping toddler language are cute. The knowledge that he possesses, because the rock is indeed in Jija's pocket and there's no way Uchi could have known it was there, dooms him. Nasun does not know that it started with the rock. When you see her, do not tell her. Ah, uh, that line for some reason just murdered my heart. When you see her, do not tell her. Like, yeah, there's no way she finds out that that is what tipped her father off and he doesn't it, it, she doesn't blame herself for like the rest of her life, right? And it's not rational, but you would. You absolutely would. And I hate it so much. And I so hope that it never comes out. But I also know that she's going to be like spending a lot of time on the road with just her dad. And she may, she may wind up figuring it out. And she's going to have to live with that, even though, again, it was made very clear to us that it was not her fault. It was not Renthree's fault. Her father is a horrible man and a bigot and he is, you know, we can say he's a good man and I just can't, I can't reconcile being a good man with, with being able to murder a child. I just can't do it. You know, like I'm, it's, it's the same, it's the same as with any like bigotry. You'd be like, well, you know, other than that, he's a good guy. Is he? I just can't with that kind of thinking. And I, in some ways wish that I, I could it because I feel like it'd be easier to like go through the world and see the, the good in people as outweighing certain things. But I just am not really able to do that. It's, it's, 
there are things that are non-negotiables for me. And call me crazy, not murdering a child is one of those things. You know? So when she gets home, he is shaking, standing over the corpse of his own little boy and demands of her, is she one too? And she says, yes. And he already knew when he asked. So the fact that she says yes helps a little bit because otherwise he would have flipped out that she was lying to him because he knows really. She's not really afraid in this moment. The sight of her brother's body and her mind's refusal to interpret what she's seeing have frozen all cognition within her. She's not even sure what Jija is asking since understanding the context of his words would require her to acknowledge that what stains her father's fists is blood and that her brother is not merely sleeping on the floor. She can't, not right then, but absent any more coherent thought, and as children sometimes do in extreme situations, Nasun regresses. What she sees frightens her, even if she does not understand why. And of the two of her parents, it is Jija to whom Nasun has always been closer. She's his favorite, too, the firstborn, the one he never expected to have, the one with his face and sense of humor. She likes his favorite foods. He's had vague hopes of her following in his footsteps as a napper. So when she starts crying, she does not quite know why. And as her thoughts scroll about and her heart screams, she takes a step towards him. His fists tighten, but she cannot see him as a threat. He is her father. She wants comfort. Daddy, she says. Jija flinches, blinks, stares as if he has never seen her before. Realizes he cannot kill her, not even if she is... No, she is his little girl. She steps forward again, reaching out. He cannot make himself reach back, but he does hold still. She grabs his nearest wrist. He stands straddling Uche's body. She can't grab him around the waist the way she wants. She does, however, press her face against his bicep so comfortingly strong. She does tremble, and he does feel her tears sliding down his skin. He stands there, breath gradually slowing, fists gradually uncurling, while she weeps. After a time, he turns to face her fully and she wraps her arms around his waist. Turning to face her requires turning away from what he's done to Uche. It is an easy movement. That was another line that just punched me in the gut. It was, it is an easy movement. Like, yeah, I bet. I fucking bet it is. Ugh. Guys, I hate this so much. So she wants to know where they're going because he's like, you know, getting shit together to leave. And to comfort her, he touches the back of her head, which he doesn't know. I don't think he knows even now that it has always comforted her to be touched there because her sesapine are in the back of her head. And when he touches her there, she can perceive him more deeply, quote unquote. So this is not something that just works for like guardians. They get something from like the guardians take something and that's different, but there is a connection that's possible there that I didn't realize was, you know, available to just anyone. Um, is mama coming too? Something moves across Jija's face, subtle as an earthquake. No. And Nasun, who was fully prepared to go off into the sunset with some lorist, effectively running away from home to escape her mother, relaxes at last. Okay, Daddy, she says, and heads to her room to pack. Why does she want to run away from her mother? Like, I... This is one of those things that... 
I feel so bad about because my theory is that she wants to run away from her mother because her mother instills fear in her over what she is. And it's a fear that she does not understand, but she can feel. And this is something that I ran into as a child. Um, my mother was abused by a couple of men in her life, more than a couple, actually. And I never knew the details, but as a child, when she talked about or was near those men, the tone in her voice and the shape of her body would change. Like she would sort of curl in on herself and she didn't know she was doing it. But I knew that what she was talking about was deeply upsetting and frightening to her and was something that she had still not really quite dealt with. And I didn't have a specific understanding. I didn't have a, any frame of reference as a child for what this meant but I knew that it was something that remained and, and was part of her. Now I was in a position where it was part of her, but not of me. And so I was able to have sympathy, even though I didn't quite know why and to feel compassion about it, but it was still frightening. And I kind of imagine that Nasun has gone through something similar in seeing her mother talk about being an origin, but it's going to have a much different context because so is Nasun. So she's seeing her mother have this sort of like, probably like there's so much trauma in her, in her history that I would be very surprised if Sinite was able to keep that out of her voice and her body. And there's no way Nasun doesn't pick up on that being associated with being an origin and maybe thinks that her mother dislikes her somehow or is afraid of her or sees her as some sort of threat. This is just a guess, but it's the sort of thing that trauma works in weird ways. And children have, of course, a really distorted view of how, of what things are because they don't have context for a lot and they don't have the capacity to understand real danger a lot of the time. For a lot of children, danger is a hypothetical and they, have so much confidence in the adults in their lives, most children, that they don't ever really worry because they are that sure that the adults are going to be able to protect and take care of them. And so danger, when you're trying to instill it in a child of eight years old, when you're trying to let them know your ability isn't wrong and there's nothing wrong with you, but it is incredibly dangerous and it could get you killed and it could make people hate you. How do you get a child to know and understand that with them, without them internalizing what you're telling them and believing that you believe that of them also? So I can't help but think that unfortunately Cyanite's lesson in, in her lessons in trying to save her daughter's life are what drove this wedge between them. And that's such a shame that I could see Uche, who, what is he again? Like three years old? Um, this is maybe why she hasn't started teaching Uche yet. Now she may have started. We don't, I don't remember her mentioning it. If she has, I just don't remember. But I could see if you, teach one child and this seems to distance them from you 
and almost make them afraid of you that you would put off teaching the younger child because you don't want to lose them as well. But there's no way to get them to understand exactly what's happening here without scaring them, right? So anyway, um, he says, we're going somewhere you can be better, somewhere I heard of where they can help you. Make her a little girl again and not, he turns away from this thought too. What does that mean? Make her a little girl again. Is there some sort of creepy, like, corrective surgery that they're trying to, like, just remove sesapine from their heads or something? Dislike? Register my dread of whatever that's going to look like. Don't want that. I hate this so much. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Is this, like, going to be, like, electroshock, like, gay conversion therapy? Oh, God. So then we go back to cyanide and alabaster. And it's picking up right where the last book left off, where he has just said, have you ever heard of a moon? Um, he has just said that. And this starts with a what you say? A moon. Alabaster, beloved monster, sane madman, the most powerful origine in all the stillness, and in-progress stone-eater snack, stares at you. This has all of its old intensity, and you feel the will of him, the stuff that makes him the force of nature that he is, and is an almost physical rider on that stare. The guardians were fools to ever consider him tame. A satellite. A what? He makes a little sound of frustration. He's completely the same, aside from being partially turned to stone, as the days when you and he were less than lovers and more than friends. Ten years and another, and another self ago. So, yeah, this is him sort of figuring out that there's maybe something missing from their universe. Um, and he says that he wants her to just like talk to the GMS that she arrived with and get an idea from her because he doesn't have the energy to explain everything. And then he bursts out with a, <coughs> excuse me. Can you call the obelisks to you? Can you do it yet? Um, I haven't tried since may of. He groans softly shutting his eyes. You're so rusting useless cyan. Never had any respect for the craft. Just enough to get by, enough to excel, but only for gain. They told you how high, and you jumped no further, all to get a nicer apartment and another ring. For privacy, you ass, and some control over my life and some rusting respect. And you actually listened to that guardian of yours when you don't listen to anybody else. Hey, ten years as a school teacher have given your voice an obsidian edge. Alabaster actually stops ranting and blinks at you. Very quietly, you say, You know full well why I listen to him. There is a moment of silence. Both of you take this time to regroup. You're right, he says, at length. I'm sorry. Because every Imperial Origin listens, listened to their assigned guardian. Those who didn't died or ended up in a node except again for Alabaster. He never did find out what he did to his guardian. I want to know. I want to know. Um, so then they start talking about satellites and he's just like, I'm not even going to talk about this because you haven't figured out how to deal with the obelisks. So there's no point in me explaining the satellites and moons to you. Um, and this is when she starts thinking, and I'm going to do this like sort of third, like step away, uh, because this is again, a whole chapter in which it's him saying you, um, if you hadn't understood the obelisks were amplifiers, originy amplifiers, you never would have reached for the garnet to save yourself from a guardian's attack. But if the garnet obelisk hadn't been half dead itself, cracked and stuffed with a frozen stone eater, it would have killed you. 
You didn't have the strength, the self-control to prevent the power from frying you from the brain on down. Um, so he says, go and see the topaz is floating somewhere nearby. Call it tonight. Then in the morning, see, see if it's come. If it hasn't, tell me and I'll find someone else or do what I can myself. Will you still tell me what this is all about? No, because in spite of everything, as soon, I don't want you to die. It's good to see you. So at that point, she gets up and leaves. Um, <clears throat> and she passes by Antimony, who is still, like, just so unnerving to Cyanite. Like, Cyanite's just like, this, the fact that she's slowly eating his friend is just so creepy, you know? Like, or her friend, sorry, slowly eating her friend. Ah, I hate this whole thing. And I feel bad for Hoa, who, like, clearly feels that cyanite's learning about all of this is going to influence her to hate him now. And that doesn't seem to be what's happening. Like she just doesn't see him that way, but Oh my God, the whole thing is just so weird and strange and inexplicable. Nobody can explain why he's turning to stone. Like I thought when we got to this part of the book that we would get an explanation of what's happening here. But there doesn't seem to be one that anyone is familiar with. I don't know if this is a completely unprecedented event or if it's just so incredibly rare that nobody, like, has a, a reason for it, you know? Um, Tony is saying, I'm excited for this through line in the book and your reaction so effing creepy. Yeah, it is, though. Um, so... Lerna's been politely waiting outside while you and Hoa met with Alabaster and Antimony. He falls in as you come out, his expression expectant. I need to go to the surface, you say. The guards won't let you, Asun. People new to the calm aren't trusted. Kastrima's survival depends on it remaining secret. They can try to stop me. Lerna stops walking. And then you'll do what you did to Remo? Rusting hell. You stop, too, rocking a little from the force of that blow. Hoa stops as well, eyeing Lerna thoughtfully. Lerna's not glaring. The look on his face is too flat to be a glare. Damn. Okay. After a moment, Lerna sighs and comes over. We'll go to Ika, he says. We'll tell her what we need. We'll ask to go topside with guards if she wants. All right? It's so reasonable that you don't know why you didn't even consider it. Well, you know why. Ika might be an origin like you, but you spent too many years being thwarted and betrayed by other origins at the Fulcrum. You know better than to trust her just because she's your people. You should give her a chance because she's your people, though. That's interesting. Um, I really like that in particular, this idea of, like, I want, when I meet other people who are like me, I want there to be a sort of fellowship there. But I also know that the fact that we are often used against each other is reason to trust them even less at times than others. And that feels like a really real thing to me, especially like if you are coming from a marginalized group, I could see having a suspicion, especially when you're a marginalized group that has been, um, you know, exploited in a really specific way and in such a way that certain of you get treated totally differently if they go along with that, that there's like a feeling of betrayal there. Um, it's just a really, I, I like that little paragraph because it feels really revealing of this overall mindset that she's been walking around with that I think has been there this whole time, but hasn't really been described in those specific terms. Um, so when Cyanite goes and asks, um, Ika to go above ground, Ika is sort of resistant because this is not something that she understands. And Cyanite is not really supposed to explain it to her. Um, it's just, I feel frustrated and it's understandable if Alabaster thinks that people who aren't going to be directly related to this like mission, if he thinks they don't need to know, then I believe him. Alabaster's no fool, but it is always so much more frustrating when there is 
an obstacle to just explaining to people what's going on when an explanation could get them to be on your side so easily, you know? Um, the other person waiting, the man leaning on the crystal doesn't seem to be watching you, but you notice how his eyes aren't moving to track whatever he's looking at off in the distance. He's thin, shorter than you with hair and a beard that make you think of strawberries growing amid hay. You imagine the delicate pressure of his indirect attention. You do not imagine the ping of instinct that tells you he is another of your kind. Since he doesn't acknowledge your presence, you say nothing to him. And this man winds up becoming pretty like, um, he draws her attention really, really frequently. It's just something that is on her mind that he's like in the room. Whenever he speaks, it seems like she's just very aware of him, you know? And um, I like that as well, because even without, you know, being an origin and being able to sense somebody is one of you, I feel like we've all had this, right? With somebody that for whatever reason, they get our attention immediately and we don't even need to have spoken to them. But every time they talk after that, you're just kind of like, huh, I am extremely aware of of every movement you make while you're sitting next to me, things like that. And I can't help but wonder if there's not going to be something between the two of them because of the way that she reacts here. Um, <clears throat> so maybe the stone eaters knew Alabaster was coming, but they rarely talked to anyone but their chosen people. And in this case, they didn't even do that. Ika tried to throw him out, of course, though she offered him a mercy killing if he wanted. His prognosis is obvious. Gentle drugs and a bed would be a kindness. He did something when she called the strongbacks, though. The light went out. The air and water stopped. Only for a minute, but it felt like a year. When he let everything come back on, everyone was upset. So Ika said he could stay, and that we should treat his injuries. And Cyanite thinks to herself, Sounds about right. And says, He's a ten-ringer and an ass. He's from the fulcrum? Lerna inhales in what seems to be awe. Earth fires. I had no idea any Imperial origins have survived. Surprise, bitch. Lerna is just so unaware. Bless his heart. But yeah, I love the fact that she just drops it later and is like, well, I was a four ringer. I'm a six ringer now. Like, and he just looks at her like, what? Um, but there's little moments like that that I find really weirdly satisfying, even though they're essentially meaningless at this point, you know? Um, and Alabaster apparently like told them because they were, you know, sort of trying to, uh, figure out what to do with him. Um, and he told them to please like give him some time because he was waiting for somebody. So he like knew she was coming. So, yeah, this is like, I just don't know what to make of Alabaster. I really don't know what is on. His, I just wish he would fucking talk to her like straightforwardly. I, I hope that whatever he wants her to do with these obelisks works out and that she is able to then get the actual information from him on what he wants to do. Um, so she goes and talks to Ika and let's see. Okay. Um, I'd been thinking about some changes already, Sadika, sounding bored. Uh, you two arrived at a convenient time. For a moment, you think she's including Lerna in that you too, but he sits down on the divan nearest hers, and there's something, some ease of movement or comfort in his manner that tells you he's heard this before. She means Hoa, then. Hoa takes the floor, which makes him seem more like a child, though he isn't. It's strange how hard it is for you to remember that. Um, and this is when it turns out this guy who, uh, the strawberry blonde guy is named Jarka. Um, he doesn't want Ika to share anything with Cyanite. Like he feels like we don't know these people well enough. We don't know if they can be trusted. And, uh, he says that our, you know, something about our hunters can survive out there. And, there's a moment of surprise from cyanite because hunters are a use cast that's kind of like fallen by the wayside and nobody gets born into them anymore. Um, that Kastrima feels the need says more about the state of the calm than anything else Ika has told you. 
Our hunters know the terrain and our strongbacks too. Yeah. Hajarka says nearby newcomers know more about the conditions beyond our territory. I'm not sure I know anything useful. You begin, but even as you say this, you frown because you're remembering that thing. You started noticing a few roadhouses ago, the sashes or rags of fine silk on too many of the equatorials wrists. The closed looks they gave you, their focus while others sat shell-shocked. At every encampment, you saw them look their fellow survivors over, picking out any Sanzeds who were better equipped or healthier or otherwise doing better than average, speaking to those chosen people in quiet voices, leaving the next morning in groups larger than those in which they had arrived. Does that mean anything? Like keeping to like, like keeping to like is the old way, but races and nations haven't been important for a long time. Communities of purpose and diverse specialization are more efficient, as old Sanze proved. Yet Yemenis is slag at the bottom of a fissure vent by now, and the laws and ways of the empire no longer have any bite. Maybe this is the first sign of change, then. Maybe, in a few years, you'll have to leave Kastrima and find a calm full of mid-ladders like you, who are brown, but not too brown, big, but not too big, with hair that's curly or kinky but never ash blow or straight. Nasun can come with you, in that case. But how long would the both of you be able to hide what you are? No calm wants ragas. No calm except this one. So, that's interesting. Um, and I don't remember this thing with the, uh, the silks, like, tied around their wrist. Um, I don't, I, I, like, remember there being, like, some groups that seemed to be doing better, but this specific ritual of like looking them over and choosing, I didn't recall at all. And um, this sort of tribalism, I don't like, usually it doesn't bode well. So I'm a little nervous about what this is going to look like. But anyway, um, so Ika says, Something about wanting a stone eater as an advisor, wanting Hoa as an advisor. Um, why not? They're here too. More of them than we think. She focuses on Hoa, who watches her, his expression unreadable. Um, that's what you told me. It's true, he says quietly. Then, I can't speak for them, though, and we aren't part of your calm. You have an impact on our calm, if only as a potential threat. And the ones you're uh, attached to are part of this calm. You care what happens to them, at least, don't you? You realize you haven't seen Ika Stone Eater, the woman with the ruby hair, for a few hours. That doesn't mean she isn't nearby. You learn better than to trust the appearance of absence with antimony. Hoa says nothing in reply to Ika. You're suddenly irrationally glad he's bothered to stay visible for you. Yeah, I feel like Ho is really going out of his way to try and be as human as he can. He just wants to make a decent impression and, and like hold her trust. And I am dying to know why, because it feels like he just really zeroed in on her specifically. And like he's got some sort of plan in mind here. And I just don't know what that could be or what he wants from her or if it's related to the obelisks or alabaster or anything. Um. So here goes, uh, you know, questions back and forth about where everybody is from and how they grew up, yada, yada. Um, and you sit there throughout the meeting trying to understand the undercurrents you're picking up on, still not believing you're even here, while Ika lays out all the problems facing Kastrima. It's stuff you've never had to think about before. Complaints that the hot water in the communal pools isn't hot enough. A serious shortage of potters, but an overabundance of people who know how to sew. Fungus in one of the granary caverns. Several months' supply had to be burned lest it contaminate the rest. A meat shortage. You've gone from thinking obsessively about one person to having to be concerned with many. It's a bit sudden. Um... So, yeah, this is a like I enjoy whenever somebody who has just been getting by and having to survive in a basic sense starts to realize that their situation has changed and that the community that they're in is going to be in a totally different headspace. Um, this was something that happened in like uh, The Walking Dead, for example, the, the crew that we tend to follow around was out in 
the world really vulnerable and being attacked all the time. And then they come across Alexandria. And when they get there, somebody like bakes a cake for them to greet them. And they have like a little party where everybody is wearing nicer, clean clothes and getting together purely for a social like evening. And all of this crew that was just fighting for their lives on the other side of the wall, were, instead of being comforted that this community is doing well enough, that this is what they can focus on, they're disgusted, really. Um, and I feel like that's so understandable. And, and it really can be alarming how easily we get used to things being safer and better and improving and how willing we are to let our guard down. And um, I don't know that Cyanite is going to get into this quite the way that I think Ika wants her to, because I just don't think Cyanite has it in her after the number of times that she has had to like up and leave. I don't think that she's going to settle anywhere. You know, I just don't think that's, something she's capable of at this point in her life. Um, and she talks about the soil being poor and everything. And it's just like, I basically am doing my best, but it's just me and I need help. Um, the people chose her. And for the first time, um, and for the time being, they trust her. They don't know you, Lerna or Hoa. And they apparently don't trust Jarka and Cutter. You need her more than she needs any of you. Abruptly, though, Ika shakes her head. I can't talk about this shit anymore. Um, so this is when she brings up that she needs to go topside. And Ika is just like, why the fuck would you want to do that? And she says, uh, because Alabaster has asked me to do something. And Ika is sort of resistant to this. Until finally, when she says, I wore six rings once. Alabaster was my mentor. Um, origin business. Then I'm out. Come on, Cutter, since you're just a strong back. Cutter stiffens, but to your surprise, he rises and follows her out. Um, what is this, a final lesson from your old mentor? That remains to be seen. Ika looks thoughtful. All right, then just let me uh, get some strong backs together and we'll be on our way. Um, I want to see a what a fulcrum six ringer can do. Maybe see if I can too. At which point Sina is like, absolutely fucking not. Absolutely fucking no way you could die. This is not happening. I'll show you, but you are not allowed to try it yourself. And she says something about how you don't have the training, but Ika pretty quickly is like, you don't know what training I've got at all. Like maybe I didn't go to the fulcrum, but you don't know anything else. Um, and Cyanide is kind of willing to let that pass and be like, yeah, you're, okay, you're right. But still like, this is seriously nothing to fuck around with. Um, Ika meets you at the overlook in half an hour. You're not as out of breath as a few of Ika's crew by the time it's done, but you've been walking miles every day while they've been living safe and comfy, comfy in their overground, underground town. God, I can't read today. What? Um, the decoy house has strong back sentries like the other one. It's amazing how strange the surface seems to you. For the first time in weeks, you notice the sulfur stench of the air, the silvery haze, the incessant soft patter of fat ash flakes on the ground and dead leaves, which is super depressing, guys. Like this whole description is so, it's super silent. There's no animal sounds because probably a lot of animals are dead already. Um, family looking bunch about 40 minutes ago, well equipped, maybe 20 people all. Um, and all ages, all Sansas traveling north. Looks like they had a destination in mind. All Sansas, again. So there's more of this happening here. Um, so they're standing there. And finally, Ika's like, look, you need to get on with it. If you think you need to see this obelisk, I don't know what to tell you. Because with the ash in the air, there's no way you're going to be able to see shit. You close your eyes and try to still your thoughts. There are sounds to be heard around you, you notice at last. Faint creaks and pops as the wooden parts of Kastrima over react to the weight of ash or the changing warmth of the air. 
warm jitter of the earth beneath your feet. No, wrong direction. There's actually enough ash in the sky that you can sort of grasp the clouds with your awareness. Ash is powdered rock, after all, but it's not the clouds you want. Something pulls you sharply west. You jerk and turn to face it, inhaling as you remember a night long ago in a calm called Alia. And another obelisk, the Amethyst. He didn't need to see it, he needed to face it. Lines of sight, lines of force, yes, and there, far along the line of your attention, you assess your awareness being drawn towards something heavy and dark. Um, not the amethyst. The garnet was broken, mad. You're not sure why this word occurs to you. But beyond that, it was also more powerful somehow, though power is too simple a word for what these things contain. Richness, strangeness, darker colors, deeper potential, but if that's the case, onyx, you say aloud, opening your eyes. Other obelisks buzz along the periphery of your line of sight, closer, possible, but they don't respond to this near instinctive call of yours. The dark obelisk is so far away, well past the western coastals, somewhere over the unknown sea. Even flying, it might take months to arrive. But, but... The onyx hears you. You know this, the way you once knew your children had heard you, even if they pretended to ignore you. Ponderously, it turns, arcane processes awakening for the first time in an age of the earth, as it does uttering an assault of sound and vibration that shakes the sea for miles underneath. How do you know this? You're not assessing this, you just know. Then it begins to come evil eating earth you flinch back along the line that leads to yourself along the way something snags your attention and almost as an afterthought you call it too the topaz it is lighter livelier much closer and somehow more responsive perhaps because you perceive a hint of alabaster in its interstices like a curl of citrus rind added to a savory dish he's prepped it for you then you snap back into yourself and turn to Ika, who's frowning at you you follow that? I, that was something I'm not sure what. Don't reach for either one when they get here, because you're sure they're coming. Don't reach for any of them, ever. You're reluctant to say obelisk. Too many stills around, and even if they haven't killed you yet, stills never need to hear that something, uh, need to hear that something can make origins even more of a danger than they already are. What would happen if I did? It's a question of honest curiosity, not challenge, but some questions are dangerous. You decide to be honest. You would die. I'm not sure how. Actually, you're pretty sure she would spontaneously ignite into a white-hot screaming column of fire and force, possibly taking all of Kastrima with her, but you're not 100% sure, so you stick to what you know. Yeah, good call. Just don't, just don't mention this, you know? Um... So, yeah, she says the things are like the batteries some equatorial comms use. Um... What you're talking about isn't a battery. They were making sugar batteries when I left Yemenis, you said. She's not saying obelisk either. Good. She gets it. Batteries can be made more powerful, um, made more than one way. But if a battery is too powerful for the circuit you attach it to, you figure that's enough to get the idea across. She shakes her head again, but you think she believes you. As she turns and starts to pace in thought, you notice Lerna. He's been quiet all this time. And now he seems deep in thought, and that bothers you. You don't like that a still is thinking so hard about this. Um, so he then asks how old Ika thinks the calm is that they are currently in. Um, and then you understand. Crystals in Kastrima, under that glow through some means you can't fathom. Crystals that float in the sky by some means you can't fathom. Both mechanisms meant to be used by Origines and no one else. Stone eaters showing an inordinate interest in Origines who use either. You glance at Hoa, but he isn't looking at you. He is crouched on the ashy ground just off the walkway, staring at something. You follow his gaze and see a small mound in what was once the front yard of the house next door. It looks just like another pile of ash, maybe three feet high, but then you notice a tiny desiccated animal foot poking out of the end. Cat, maybe. 
or rabbit. There are probably dozens of small carcasses around here buried under the ash. Um, something really has unnerved him. So he, she says something about how, like to him, like, you're not usually afraid of things. What's going on? And he says, I'm afraid of things that will hurt you. And you believe him because suddenly you realize that's been the commonality of all his strange behavior so far. His willingness to face the Kirkusa, his ferocity towards other stone eaters, he's protecting you. So few have ever tried to protect you in your life. It's impulse that makes you lift a hand and stroke it over his weird white hair. He blinks. Something comes into his eyes that is anything but inhuman. You don't know what to think. This, though, is why you listen to him. Let's go, you say. You suspect he won't be displeased by the extra obelisk when you tell Alabaster, if he doesn't already know. Now, maybe, finally, he'll tell you what the rust is going on. And I hope that that's true. I hope that he takes her word that it worked and he doesn't wait for them to arrive. Um, so I hardly have any time left, but I am going to go ahead and uh, do chapter three, which is Shafa Forgotten. This is the worst. I hate it. Ugh. So it starts off with him facing off with Cyanite and Cyanite being able to do something to the air using the obelisk. Shafa knows what's coming the instant he feels the obelisk's pulse. He's old, Cyanite's guardian, so old. He knows what stone eaters do to powerful origins whenever they get the chance. And he knows why it's crucial to keep origins' eyes on the ground and not the sky. He has seen what happens when a four ringer, that's how he still thinks of Cyanite, connects to an obelisk. He does genuinely care about her, you realize. She does not realize. It isn't all about control. She's his little one, and he has protected her in more ways than she knows. The thought of her agonizing death is unbearable to him. This is ironic, considering what happens next. In the moment when Cyanite stiffens and her frame becomes suffused with light, and the air within the Klausu's tiny forward compartment shivers and turns into a nearly solid wall of unstoppable force, Shafa happens to be standing to one side of a hanging bulkhead rather than in front of it. His companion, the guardian who has just killed Cyanite's feral lover, is not so lucky. When the force slams him backward, the bulkhead juts out from the wall at just the right height and angle to shear his head off before giving way itself. Shafa, however, flies backward unobstructed through the Klausu's capacious hold, which is empty because the ship hasn't been out on a piracy run for a while. There's room enough for his velocity to slow a little and for the greatest force of Cyanite's blow to move past him. When he finally does hit a bulkhead, it is with merely bone-breaking force and not bone-pulverizing force. So then all of the stone comes up from the bottom. And this line, guys, I love when when the Kindle tells me how other people have highlighted a certain section. According to Kindle, 395 have highlighted this. Shafa saw her hand on the child's face, covering mouth and nose, pressing. Incomprehensible. Did she not know that Shafa would love her son as he loved her? He would lay the boy down gently, so gently, in the wire chair. I want to get off this ride. I hate it. I just want to peel off my own skin. I hate it so much, guys. I hate it so much. And the thing is, if you are a completely twisted person, you do think that means you care about somebody like, oh, my God. It is difficult to kill a guardian. The many broken bones Shafa has suffered and the damage to his organs would not be enough to do the job in and of themselves. <sighs> Even drowning wouldn't be a problem. So I'm going to fast forward here. Because I'm out of time. I almost just did the first two chapters because I was like, this book it takes so much to talk about. I bet two will be enough. But I didn't. And I should have. Um, and I will probably get into this a little bit more next episode covering this book. I'll try and like recover this because I won't be able to do it justice this time. 
But what it comes down to is that guardians have obviously undergone some sort of weird surgical process that alters them forever. And they live off of, they get their abilities somehow off of the power that origins have in their sesapine, which is also a low level force that regular people have, but not remotely to the same degree. So basically he drains of all that power while just simply trying to stay alive and winds up like in somebody's house as they take care of him. He's like washed up on the beach and somebody takes him into their home and cares for him. And he is on empty. He is almost a regular person again. And a little boy who can see from his faded clothing that he was a guardian. This little boy is an origin and has not come out to his family, of course, because fucking why would you? This dude who collected Shafa has already said they should be drowned as babies. But he is a an origin who wants to be protected. And so he comes out to Shafa and Shafa is able to touch the back of this boy's head and refill a little bit of that energy. And it feels so good that he decides to go ahead and get some of that from the rest of the family. Unfortunately, it kills regular people. So he like walks around the house and kills half this boy's family before collecting the boy and not letting him say goodbye to anybody because they're dead, except for like some of his cousins and other parts of his family. And you leave with him. Like I keep saying you, even though this is not written in that sense. Um, Tony says, what do you make of the voice in Shafa's head? Yeah, I'm going to say, I'll just read this. Um, His terror suddenly vanishes a bad sign. It is replaced a moment later by an anger so powerful that it blots out everything else. He stops screaming and trembles with it. But even as he does so, he knows this anger is not his own. In his panic, he has opened himself to danger. And the danger that he fears above all others has come striding through the door as if it owns the place already. It says to him, if you wish to live, that can be arranged. Oh, evil earth. More offers, promises, suggestions, and their rewards. Shafa can have more power, power enough to fight the current and the pain and the lack of oxygen. He can live for a price. No, no, he knows the price. Better to die than pay it. But it is one thing to resolve to die, quite another to actually carry out that resolve in the midst of dying. Something burns at the back of Shafa's skull. This is a cold burn, not like the fire in his nose and throat and chest. Something there is waking up, warming up, gathering itself, ready for the collapse of his resistance. We all do what we have to do, comes the reducer's whisper, or seducer's, who I, interesting that I said reducer. Um, And this is the same reasoning Shafa has used on himself too many times, justifying too many atrocities. One does what one must for duty, for life. It's enough. The cold presence takes him. So this feels like whatever implant, and this is what I believe is happening, these guardians have in the back of their neck to sort of mimic the sesapine of origins is all attached to some sort of central control that one person or being or entity is sort of controlling and that they are like, able to step in if the person's own will and life is no longer capable of sustaining the body for whatever reason. I really have to wrap this and I want to talk about this a lot more and I'm really frustrated that this is where I have to end. So uh, whoever commissions the next episode, I will be recovering this chapter a little bit more in depth before I start talking about the next one, just warning you. But yeah, this is so weird. And if I just don't understand if they're that old, the guardians, what the hell could be the deal with them then? You know, because I assumed that they were started with the fulcrum, but it seems like they're way older than the fulcrum. So I don't know. Um, 
but yeah, just so strange. Um, Tony, what a fucked up scene. Yeah, it is. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry that I went over guys. I'm sorry that things are just weird today, but many thanks to Jason for commissioning this so far. I'm very, very interested and, um, I'm hoping that I can cover another couple of chapters soon. So thank you for bearing with me and I will see you soon. Toodaloo motherfuckers.